So thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Kahlia Water Foundation's part two workshop. Um, this is intended to really focus on community water systems. Again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, the purpose of this workshop is to really help build capacity and provide information related to drinking water within the Kahlia Water Foundation service area and really to have a conversation with residents and um, specifically impacted users um, where a drinking water supply is impacted by nitrates. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. We did already have two identical part one workshops on January 7th and January 16th. Um, if you weren't able to join us for those, we are gonna get them posted to the website, which I'll share later. And the meeting materials are all available um, on the website as well. These part two workshops are specific to today's on community water systems. And on January 31st, we'll also have another workshop focused on domestic well users. So again, today's workshop is happening in both Spanish and English simultaneously with options to join by Zoom or by um, telephone. Um, questions and answers will be connected between both workshops. We are sharing those in real time between the two so that everyone can benefit from the same conversation. Um, if you would like to join the Spanish meeting, um, instead of this meeting being held in English, there's information posted at kawiawater.org slash outreach, or it is also shared in the chat of this meeting here on Zoom if you are in Zoom. If you have difficulties during this call or need technical assistance, um, we have bilingual assistance available at 559-325-4463. Then okay. I'm gonna stop sharing again real quick and start all over. While I'm doing that, um, I can also do introductions. So my name is Sarah Rutherford. I am serving as the interim director for the um, Kawia Water Foundation. Um, so Malka is also joining us, Malka Coppell from Sacramento State. Um, and then we also have our host Trilby Barton, who is assisting in the chat and helping us mute and unmute ourselves as needed. So with that, um, you'll see this slide again. Um, when we take a short break, um, but wanted to start with really how can you engage with the Kahlia Water Foundation? How can we have a dialogue during this time of working remotely? Um, so one key point is to attend this workshop or to also if, if it applies or is of interest to you to attend the January 31st um, web, uh, workshop, which is starting at two and will be over before four. We also are asking that you stay informed and share your thoughts and feedback and, and um, stories and experiences either in Spanish or English um, at any time. And I'm gonna read through these for those that are joining us by phone only. So the email is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at kawiawater.org. You can also call our voicemail line. Um, this can be anonymous. You can leave a message. We also have someone, real live person, also answering that phone. You can call at 559-325-4463. You can also write a letter to the Kahlia Water Foundation. Our physical address is at 130 North Garden Street, Visalia, California, 93291. You can follow us on social media on Facebook or on Instagram um, at Kahlia Water Foundation. Um, on social media, we'll be posting additional workshops. Um, we'll also be posting information about the ongoing work of the foundation, but you can also leave us a message and, and we can interact with um, the community in that way as well. You can also visit our website at kawiawater.org. And also at our website, you can sign up for automatic email updates. So <clears throat> the part two workshop agenda, we are, we are conducting recommend introductions right now. Um, we will then review understanding your drinking water presentation and questions and answers. We will also have drinking water solutions for nitrate impacted users short-term, long-term, 
And then also time for questions and answers and exchange. We'll then take a short break, about five, or I'm sorry, about 10 minutes, so that we can um, exchange information with the Spanish workshop and where we can pull together what we're hearing and themes and an understanding of, of what we're hearing in this workshop as well as the Spanish workshop. We can then have a discussion and then um, a conclusion. So I'm now on slide six. Malka, are you seeing slide six? Yes, I am. Great. And so Malka will introduce to us how to use the Zoom screen, screen for those of us joining um, on Zoom. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I'm Malka Coppell from Sac State. Uh, and uh, so people are accessing this meeting in a variety of ways. Um, uh, if you are uh, accessing it via the computer, um, I'd like to uh, ask you if you're comfortable introducing yourself to introduce yourself via the chat which is the bottom, I think, located in the bottom of your screen. It's the bottom of my screen. Uh, just to introduce, just uh, type in your name. And if you are, have an affiliation, an organization, or if you are a member of the community, um, please feel free to add that as well. Um, I am now on slide seven, which is who is the queer? What is the Queer Water Foundation? Um, so our, the Queer Water Foundation mission is to maintain and improve the quality of life within this Kauia sub-basin by implementing programs that provide access to safe drinking water for residents and also by enhancing the quality of ground, groundwater drinking water supplies for residents in the region. So with that, I'll move on to slide eight. So the Kauia Water Foundation service area is um, on the northern portion, at its most northern point, um, Highway 201, and the northern boundary roughly follows uh, Cottonwood Creek. On the west side, it extends to West Goshen and almost directly south to Joaquina. The southern border, um, as you can, if you can see this, this map, um, extends from Joaquina to the east, um, just south of Tulare, south of Lindsay. And then on the east side, um, roughly follows where the foothills meet the um, valley floor and um, includes Woodlake, Lind Cove, Lemon Cove, Tuleyville, and Tonyville. So I'm now on slide nine. As I mentioned earlier, we do have another workshop for domestic well users. Um, the domestic well um, user workshop is designed to help inform residents provided them with information about domestic wells and there's a typo on the screen so please forgive me um, but also all are welcome to this workshop however um, if you this workshop as I mentioned is for those hooked up to state small or community water systems but if you have a domestic well and um, the workshop targeted to to those users is Sunday, January 31st, beginning at two and ending before four. And you can attend by video conference at this link here or also on um, the link is provided on the website um, or we can, um, what was, or it's posted in various locations around um, the communities. You can also attend by telephone with the phone numbers listed here. So with that, we'll start with understanding your drinking water. And with that, I need to make a small adjustment with my screen so that I can also see my notes. So give me just one well, moment. While Sarah's doing that, I, I'll, I wanted to let you know that we will, uh, we'll, we're going to have two presentations and we're going to pause at various points during both of those presentations uh, to, so you can um, ask questions uh, or comment. Uh, for those of you who are accessing via computer, and I think that's all of you at the moment, um, you have a couple of ways to ask questions. Uh, one is you can uh, type a question into the chat, um, or you can uh, raise your hand uh, either by using the raise hand button in the participant screen, or just turn your camera on and wave it, uh, and, uh, and I will call on you. 
Thank you, Malka. So with that, we'll start the conversation on understanding your drinking water. This is a brief review if you were able or joined us in one of the first two workshops, um, but we thought it was possible that some people might not have been able to join those. So we briefly wanted to cover a little bit about groundwater and drinking water. So I'm now on slide 11. Where does my tap water come from? So tap water is provided to homes, either a public water system, for example, city of Tulare, Exeter, Farmersville, or by a domestic well. Tap water must meet state or federal standards in order to be safe to drink. Um, not all wells or public water systems within the Cahuilla Water Foundation service area meet all of these standards. Roughly 90% of Tulare's, Tulare County's drinking water comes from groundwater. The remaining 10% comes from surface water supplies. So briefly, what is groundwater? Um, the shortest explanation is that groundwater is water that's contained in between soil particles. So I'm now on slide 13, which illustrates how does surface water move into groundwater? And so starting at bullet number one in the middle at the top, you see an illustration of, of arrows or water coming down onto the surface of the earth um, illustrated here is grass. So water hits the surface and begins to move into the soil through what's called an unsaturated zone. Minerals, I'm sorry, the soil also contains minerals and chemicals from both natural and human sources and water moves its way through to what we call the water table, or also known as an aquifer. As water flows through this soil, it can also move some chemicals or minerals into the groundwater aquifer. But also, and I went a little out of order, but multiple la layers of soil um, can also help to filter out bacteria, trash, and insects. So we're now on slide 14, and the question is, can chemicals or minerals in groundwater be harmful? So not all chemicals or minerals are necessarily good or bad. Um, some are, especially minerals, are very essential for survival and health. But different amounts or a concentration of a chemical or mineral in water can change the water's color, smell, or safety to drink, and also hardness, which is, you may notice um, some white mineral deposits on your shower or your faucet. And that's, that is um, what we mean when we say hardness. So we're now on slide 15. So listed here on this slide are contaminants found locally with potential health impacts. And those are nitrate, which is the key focus of the Cahuilla Water Foundation's programs. Also perchlorate, 1,2,3-trichloropropane, which is also known as TCP, 1,2-dibromo-3-chloropropane, which is also known as DBCP, arsenic, hexavalent chromium, and trichloroethylene, which is also PCE. So we're now on slide 16. So I mentioned nitrate. What is nitrate? Well, it's a chemical that's composed of both nitrogen and oxygen. It can be found naturally in the atmosphere um, via lightning, or it can be directly produced by humans and animals as waste products. So we're now on slide 17. So what are some of the sources of nitrate that can be found in groundwater as it moves through the soil? These include agricultural sources, nitrogen-based fertilizers commonly used um, on household lawns, Natural and atmospheric is mentioned with lightning, sewage and septic waste from, from rural homes and animal manure. So with that, that is a brief review of understanding your drinking water. And so we wanted to pause here for any clarifying questions or um, thoughts on, on, on drinking water within the Cuyah Water Foundation service area. Are there any questions at this time? Again, you can use the uh, raise hand button or just wave. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so go ahead, Sarah. 
So moving on to public water systems and nitrate impacted drinking water within the Clear Water Foundation. So the question is, is my drinking water from a public water system safe to drink? So your tap water come, probably comes from a public water system if you live within city limits and your, you or your landlord pay a water bill. So to find the name of your public water system, you can look on the bill or you may need to ask the landowner or landlord. Public water systems are legally required to test water for contaminants and to treat, treat that drinking water to meet what's called an MCL standard or maximum contaminant level. Public water systems are also required to notify their users and ratepayers of MCL exceedances. These notices are mailed to the homeowner, but if you rent and you aren't the person paying for this bill, that notice may go to the landlord. Public water systems also are required to publish what's called a consumer confidence report. This is published annually. Um, to find this, you can search online for the name of your public water system and the words consumer confidence report. So we're now on slide 21 to discuss a little bit more about maximum contaminant levels, or we call them MCLs. So a drinking water MCL is set to protect human health. And these levels are set by both state and federal government. MCLs are set at a different level or amount for, for each potential contaminant. And that's expressed as a concentration of the contaminant, usually described in numbers of milligrams per liter. As in the case of nitrate, the drinking water standard or the MCL is 10 milligrams per liter of water. We are now on slide 22. Oh, we have some Spanish that joined us on this slide. <laughs> so um, how to read your consumer confidence report. Um, there's an illustration here. Some are organized a little differently, but I wanted to talk through the different components. So there's the type or the chemical name. So the illustration here is nitrate. There's also the year for which it was tested. The concentration unit, sometimes referred to as parts per million. There's also the maximum contaminant level, which is that MCL of 10. There's a public health goal, which may be different than an MCL, but in this case, it remains the same. Your consumer confidence report should also indicate to you if the drinking water system is in compliance. So in this example, the answer is yes. There's also some information about the general data collected. So there's usually a range from the smallest to the largest amount of the chemical measured in that exact year. This does not necessarily indicate if your water is safe to drink. There's also an average, and this is the average concentration measured in that time period. This also does not tell you precisely if your water is safe to drink. So a little bit more, I'm now on slide 23, about nitrate and groundwater. So the safe drinking water level for nitrate, as I mentioned, is less than 10 milligrams per liter. Some local wells and public water systems do have nitrate concentrations above 10 milligrams per liter. Water that is over 10 milligrams per liter and nitrate should not be used for drinking, making formula, or for cooking. Water high in nitrate can be safely used to bathe, clean, do laundry, wash dishes, and to also grow crops. So possible health impacts of nitrate Nitrate can interfere with your body's ability to carry oxygen in your blood and can cause nitrate poisoning called methemoglobioma, which is really hard to say, so it's commonly referred to as blue baby syndrome. And symptoms can develop really quickly, especially in infants, and may include um, shortness of breath and blueness of the skin or lips. And if it's left untreated, it may be fatal. And now on slide 26, more possible health impacts of nitrate. So if you see these symptoms, medical attention should be sought immediately. And as mentioned, infants, especially under six months old, 
and pregnant women are the most at risk. Now on slide 27. So we talked about consumer confidence reports and for public water systems. So once you look at your consumer confidence report or you get a notice from your public water system that your drinking water is high in nitrate, what should you do? Do not drink or cook your with your water, that is unsafe. Do not use water to make baby formula, also unsafe. Do not boil your water because boiling does not remove nitrates and do not use a store-bought counter pitcher. Those filters do not remove nitrates. Again, you can safely bathe, do laundry, wash your hands, clean, wash dishes with water in your home that may be high in nitrate. So this map illustrates um, all of the small water systems and that's defined as five to 15 connections or households within the Kalia Water Foundation service area. So these are smaller communities and they're illustrated here with a purple dot. Um, I would like to make this font a little bit larger, but um, they include places like Elbow Creek School, Buena Vista School, Preet Market, Joaquina Elementary School, a couple of other schools. Um, additionally, a learning center in, um, called Eleanor Roosevelt. And then um, some offices or um, packing house um, um, buildings or locations may also be considered a small system because they provide water to more than 25 people. I'm now on slide 29. This map illustrates small water systems with nitrate exceedances served at the top within the Kalia Water Foundation. And in this map, all of the other purple dots went away except for Joaquina Elementary School, where drinking water does not meet the drinking water, where water served there does not meet the drinking water standard. I'm now on slide 30. This illustrates all of the public water systems. And so those are any system with 15 connections or households um, or greater within the Kalia Water Foundation. And so we've tried to capture these by color. So you can see those in green and yellow are larger and include Visalia, Tulare, Farmersville, Exeter, Lindsay, and a few more. Those that are um, between 50 and less than 100 connections, they're a little smaller to see, but those are illustrated in purple and in blue. That includes Oakieville, Salt's Track, um, Track 92, um, West Hills Track, um, Tonyville, Tuleyville, um, and a few others. This map illustrates um, both public water systems, large and small, within the Kalia Water Foundation service area, which currently serve water that does not meet the nitrate drinking water standard. And so using the best available data, we have defined Lemon Cove and Joaquina as currently not meeting the drinking water standard for nitrate within our service area. So I'll pause there now to offer any clarification or um, additional um, questions on understanding your drinking water and specific to public water systems. Uh, any questions at this time? A lot of information. So also, if you want Sarah to repeat anything, feel free to ask. Yeah, thanks, Malka. It was a lot and we did go a little quickly, um, but happy to go back and review any of those slides. Okay, I still don't see anybody else that's joined um, by phone only. So I think we can move on, Malka. Go ahead, yep. Okay, great. So we're moving on to the next section where we'd like to discuss possible sol solutions for nitrate impacted drinking water users. So we'll talk a little more in detail about each of these options, but they include for short-term solutions, um, the use of bottled water. Also, um, it may be a good option for your household to have a reverse osmosis system installed 
Or you may choose to visit a free drinking water kiosk to fill your own water bottle with safe drinking water. So let's talk a little bit more about each of those options. Starting with the free drinking water kiosk, these are currently available. One is located in Oakieville at Avenue 229 and Road 48. There's another one located in Farmersville, um, just off of Highway 198 at the Farmersville Boulevard exit in front of the Cahuilla Delta Water Conservation District. So these drinking water kiosks, which there's a picture of one in the previous slide down here in the right hand corner, this is the one, uh, this looks like Oakieville. So these are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week to anyone. There's no sign up, there's no paperwork. Again, you bring your own disinfected bottles. There's no limit on the amount of water that you can take with you. And again, these are available now, but we are working on additional solutions coming in later in 2021. So I'm now on slide 36. So some things to consider in bottled water and using this for short-term drinking water solutions. If you elect to have bottled water in your home, it also requires space to store, preferably out of sunlight where that may introduce chemicals from the bottle itself. And bottled water jugs, depending on the size, may be difficult to move or lift. It's also important to know how much water your family will use or have the best estimate. Otherwise, you may run out of water from time to time. Now on slide 37, the reverse osmosis, or sometimes called RO. RO may not treat other contaminants, it may also not remove enough nitrate if you're receiving water that is higher, much higher in nitrates. It may not work well for some types of groundwater. We mentioned hardness earlier. If you have a lot of hardness in your groundwater, RO may not work well. Um, RO is always available and you won't run out but it does require ongo ongoing service and testing from a qualified technician. We're now on slide 38. Um, so as mentioned earlier on kiosk, um, but a little more information to think about is it does require transportation um, to be able to get to the kiosk and to get the water back home. It is available at any time and doesn't require registration, but families do need to consider to schedule enough time frequently enough so that they don't run out of water. Now on slide 39, and this is to discuss very quickly possible future long-term solutions. And again, part of the, this, the mission of the Cahuilla Water Foundation is that these options are really determined and informed by individual communities, as well as what's technically feasible. So some options may be to drill a new community well or maybe to improve an existing treatment system. If a community is located close enough to a larger system that does have safe drinking water, it may be possible to consolidate two communities together into one system. Another option is to blend multiple well water, excuse me, to blend water with other wells in order to reduce the overall concentration of a contaminant. So we'd like to pause here and Sarah Lee will help us walk through some of this on replacement water discussion and community water system users. So I'll turn it over. Yes. We do have a couple of questions in the chat that I can ask now. That sounds great. And people can start looking at these and I'll take those the first, um, the first in the chat. Okay, the first one is from, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, from John Pierce. How much does it cost to build a nitrate filtration plant? That's a really good question. And I, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I work with engineers that might. I think it depends on the size of the system. It depends on the amount of nitrate. It also would depend on other co-contaminants. For example, if there's TCP, or other issues within that system. But I can 
I'll, I'll pause quickly and ask Donald Ikemia, who's also joining us tonight, if he wanted to add anything to that response. That's a good response. It's a, it depends, um, as Sarah said. Uh, some folks, uh, what they do is that instead of adding treatment, they'll drill a new well. Uh, unfortunately, we have other issues with 123 TCP, arsenic, um, other contaminants that could counteract. You get good water with regards to low nitrates, but you get bad water with regards to high arsenic. And so then you end up having to add a treatment system for arsenic in addition to the nitrate uh, solution. So, uh, I mean, it could be a couple hundred dollars for under sink treatment system in your house. It could be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, drilling a new well, putting in a treatment system, connecting everything, a tank, uh, the, the control systems. I mean, it, it could be very expensive um, if, and again, it all depends on the situation and, and all costs in between. So, good, good question, uh, difficult answer. Yeah, thank you, John. Typically, um, or, or sometimes, you know, we'll see communities ask for a feasibility study to be done first to, to kind of weigh these options of what's the best long-term solution. Um, we have a comment from Kevin McCusker. Some households with limited income are also carrying a monetary burden to pay a water utility bill for tap water that does not meet public health standards and paying an additional monthly expense for packaged water for drinking and cooking. There's also an issue with the capital cost to build the treatment facility versus the ongoing operational expense of running the treatment facility. Yeah. That's, that's straight to the point, Kevin, and I appreciate that. That is what the mission of this organization, the foundation, is intended to get right at, is that disproportionate cost and um, burden for users whose water does not meet the, the nitrate drinking water standard. Uh, we will be working on replacement water options and that's part of our discussion here today is what do communities want? What do users see as the best fit? And that's the exact kind of um, conversation that we want to have is, is, is that those costs would then be covered by the foundation, but the solution needs to fit those users. So in both the, the short term and the long term, the foundation is seeking to secure grants and work with um, the state to implement long term solutions. But in the immediate short term, beginning um, in May and June of 2021, the Kuya Water Foundation will begin bottled, either bottled water delivery services, reverse osmosis, installation or additional kiosks may be constructed if a community feels that that's an option that would best serve them. So yeah, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. That's exactly exactly what prompted the Kuya Water Foundation to be formed. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Okay. Give people a chance. Is Sarah Lee still here with us or did she step out into the Spanish She's meeting? Here? Yeah. I'm here, Sarah. Great. Do you want to talk through some of the, the conversation on this slide? Yes, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Lee. I'm with the Kuya Water Foundation as the Early Action Plan um, Project Manager, working with, with Sarah and Melka and others. So um, this slide, slide 40, is um, where we're going to have, we hope to have a, a, a good discussion about replacement water. So just to review um, what Sarah Rutherford shared, short-term replacement water options in the Kuya service area look like potentially bottled water, reverse osmosis in certain cases, and water kiosks or filling stations. Potential long-term replacement water options um, could look like a new well, um, improved treatment, system consolidation, or um, blending water um, between more than one well. Um, so with that in mind of what the replacement water options look like um, in the short and long term, um, our purpose is to have invite some discussion, um, hear your voices, 
find out um, what impacted residents in the Korea service area, and particularly in the communities um, that are currently served with non-compliant water um, for nitrate, which are Lemon Cove and Joaquina, um, what impacted residents in those communities um, see as their preferences for replacement water. Um, and um, this will be mentioned a few times today, but we, we just want to let everyone know that we are really grateful you're here. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your time with us tonight. And we're eager to hear your stories and your thoughts, comments, and questions. And that feedback will um, be part of the early action plan to the best of our ability. So um, that's what will happen with your comments. So um, we have here three bullet points um, to guide this discussion. And we're also open to um, your ideas as well. So what situations make um, replacement water solutions more or less attractive to you as an impacted resident? What criteria, meaning pros or cons, are the most important to you when considering replacement water options? Uh, what more would you like to know or need to know to guide your preference for replacement water? If you would like to speak, um, as, as Malka said, um, you can make a comment in the chat, you could raise your hand, and with 20 participants on the, on the call, um, you can also unmute yourself and, and share um, your, your thoughts, comments, reactions. Um, we're here to listen and we would really appreciate your feedback. This is, this is Kevin from, from Cal Water. Um, I, I, I don't wanna take up a bunch of bandwidth since I'm not a resident of one of those communities. I'm just in, in the water sector and have an interest and wanted to listen to the conversation, but um, I'm just wondering if you've mapped out where there are situations of multiple uh, MCL issues. So, uh, you know, a community might want to install, uh, and I think it was already brought up, that nitrate um, treatment in and of itself, and I realize nitrate is the focus of the foundation, but if, it, if there are multiple um, substances in the water and multiple um, MCL violations across a, a broader spectrum, the nitrate, um, even at the expense of nitrate treatment, it still might not bring the system into compliance. So that I, I think that has to be considered in the total cost that any given community is looking at with regard to this topic. Yeah, it's a great point, Kevin. Thank you. Um, we are, we haven't really mapped we have the data available, but I'll say we are in the process of completing um, what's called a preliminary uh, management zone proposal. And in that, we, we did look um, specifically at 123 TCP um, and focused and honed in a little bit more on our domestic well users, um, again, to help people feel informed about maybe deciding um, to have a reverse osmosis system um, installed. But yes, um, I think that's a really fair point that that the overall goal for our communities is to have drinking water that's safe for all constituents um, or potential contaminants of concern. Um, so I think the state would certainly not support a project in which we meet a compliance metric for nitrate, but not for another co-contaminant. Um, again, I, I want to be clear, I'm not an engineer. Um, and, and Kevin, I think you're, you may be more equipped to, to help inform myself as well as maybe others, but um, the treatment process for those things, and I, I do understand they can they can create um, issues amongst themselves. As you treat for nitrate, you end up with a byproduct that then interferes with your process in treating for TCP. Um, for a random example that I don't have much more info, but um, yeah, I think that that is the ultimate goal for our communities and to have safe drinking water. Um, I think it's going to take some time to get there for the infrastructure solutions, which is exactly why we want to also have this conversation about short term and immediate solutions for people to have drinking water available as soon as May of 2021. Any other comments? 
questions? And Kevin, you might be able to answer the question too, is are reverse osmosis the best opportunity for at home filtration of drinking water? Uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question, Lisa, but I do know that it's one for a domestic well user, it's one of, uh, it's one of the options. When you're talking about a community water system, um, it can present different challenges because there could be other constituents in the groundwater that you're treating for. And so um, I think that's what, what we're, you know, was just being referred to that if it was a single constituent in the, in the groundwater, then there might be a preferred method of treatment. But then when you start compiling multiple um, constituents within that water, then you have to look at, um, you know, other options um, in some cases, whether it's ion exchange or, or, um, or, or whatever. And uh, so, you know, those things all make a difference in the choice. Um, the same thing with the domestic well users, reverse osmosis might be an adequate option for um, nitrate um, uh, issues. And, and, you know, I used to live outside of Visalia on a domestic well that had nitrate issues. And, um, but I never had the water tested for one, two, three TCP either. So even if I had installed the appropriate treatment for um, um, uh, nitrate on my domestic well, I still might not have, um, you know, been been providing water in my household. Um, I would have went through that expense and still not had safe drinking water uh, in my household. It's a, it's a it's a really complicated thing at the domestic well level because um, most homeowners don't go through a regular testing regimen. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you taking that on. You, you did it much better than I could have. Um, and, and to Lisa, that is really why we want to have a better understanding because as Kevin alluded to, um, reverse osmosis doesn't treat for 1,2,3-TCP. You need activated carbon to deal with TCP, which is a different thing you would need to have installed on your home. Um, so, and, and as I also mentioned, RO, might not work well if you have elevated hardness or uh, not elevated, but if you have water that is considered to be hard. And then also um, if you have nitrate concentrations, depending on the system, if it exceeds the limits of that reverse osmosis system, it won't get enough nitrate out of your drinking water to still be safe. So one thing, um, this is more on the domestic well user side, but we are, we are as a, the Kahlua Water Foundation, working to also begin a domestic well testing program, again, as soon as May or June of 2021. And we're also working with community partners as well as the, the State Division of Drinking Water and others to, um, to have a comprehensive well testing program where, um, where it makes sense to test for multiple um, constituents. So even though this project is primary, is solely focused on nitrates, um, it's very misleading and not very honest to just tell people, well, here's your nitrate result. And so we're working to be able to test for other common co-contaminants so that people are really informed, just like, just like Kevin was describing. Um, with respect for, for a public water system treatment within our service area, um, we've mentioned Lemon Cove and I, I do see that Bill is here as well. So I'll, I'll try to, to speak um, eloquently to this, but um, the data that we have shows that Lemon Cove um, occasionally has exceedances for total coliform and then also for nitrates. And so, um, what we're currently seeing in the case of Lemon Cove is not a lot of other co-contaminants, um, as is mentioned, TCP. Um, and, and Lemon Cove is in the process. They've recently dr drilled two new wells, um, and they're working um, to have those new wells connected to the existing um, service area. And so, you know, part of what we're interested in discussing is is um, what are the needs in Lemon Cove and, and, and is there something that as a foundation we can do while that, that system is waiting to be connected? 
There's a question in the chat from John Pierce. What about atmospheric water generators? Small communities have land resources that can be used for solar arrays. They can sell power to the farms to pay for the water generation equipment. Right, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put Donald on the spot here again um, because I, I believe he's had some more of those conversations. Um, you're right, the footprint of, of those systems um, can be accommodated in some of our more rural areas. Um, and, and it depends again on what the community prefers. Um, I think in some cases um, they can be connected and integrate households into it, but in some cases um, users would still need to go and fill bottles at, at the point of um, collection. So Donald, would you like to add more to that? I know you spent some time on this. Yes, um, we've had conversations with a company. Um, I guess they're called Source Global now. They've changed their name uh, recently. And the engineer there has given presentations to a few of us. Uh, and they do, they do have an atmospheric water generation system, goes off of uh, solar. But uh, um, it's one of those things where, again, it's, it's the cost of it and the application of it may not necessarily answer everyone's question or, or need. Um, you know, is it good for a large, uh, you know, uh, community? Um, maybe drilling a well, new well is actually cheaper on the long run. Um, is it good for a single household? Uh, possibly. What happens when it's foggy? Uh, what happens when it's uh, not sunny outside and you don't get the power generation or you don't get the the operation of it as as well, or what if what happens when it's um, 110 degrees outside? Um, you know, what's the performance of it? So, um, or is it cheaper just putting in an RO unit and maintaining it and operating that? So, uh, we've had conversations with them. Um, it's a, a potential option. Um, there has been a pilot project uh, done here or there, uh, and uh, we are monitoring that. I believe it's in Madera County. And so, yes, that, that is a good possibility. Uh, and, and as mentioned, you know, I'd say, you know, looking at all solutions uh, is a great way to uh, potentially find uh, the answer for each customized individual community. Uh, they're all, they're all going to be different. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Donald. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I wanted to get back a little bit to the question and questions surrounding Lemon Cove since um, that area has been identified as a public water system, which is serving um, water that doesn't meet the nitrate standard. Um, we've also mentioned Joaquina. Um, Joaquina is a small system um, based on the school that is out there. And, um, and to our understanding, um, the state currently has a bottled water program which provides bottled water to the students when they're on campus. Um, and so we will also be working in that area to develop both um, short-term and long-term solutions um, in the Joaquina area. We're also aware that Sequoia Union, Union um, school district also um, is working on long-term solutions to provide um, drinking water to the students at Sequoia Union, which is just outside of Lemon Cove. Um, and Sequoia Union also has a bottled water program um, for when students are on campus. Any other questions? I've been checking the questions from the Spanish meeting and we do have a question there that I wanted to share in, in this meeting. Uh, we're trying to get uh, folks from both meetings to see what questions are being asked and, and to hear the responses. So um, Eric Oriana uh, asked, uh, is bottled water brought to the resident's home or is there a location to collect the water? 
Thank you, Malka, for relaying that across the platforms. Um, we are, the Kuiya Water Foundation is looking to, to make all options available um, as impacted users are interested in them. So that includes working with um, what we call drop off or pickup points, um, where we'd like to try and coordinate perhaps with Tulare County Food Link so that users may pick up bottled water um, at those distribution sites. Um, there's also the bottled water option mentioned earlier of users filling their own jugs. And then we are also working to provide um, home delivery services for bottled water. Um, additionally, we are interested to hear from impacted residents on um, their preferences for short-term replacement water solutions, including how far they would um, be willing or comfortable to travel to get bottled water or a filling station and various preferences like that. I just shared in the chat the um, English version of our impacted resident stakeholder survey on the website. Um, we have a Spanish version of it as well on the website on the um, outreach tab. And we very much want to hear from impacted residents on that question of, um, do they prefer bottled water be delivered? Do they prefer to pick it up? Do they prefer um, replacement water of a different sort, for example, a filling station? And some of the details on distance, uh, frequency, things like that. Does anyone here have um, comments or thoughts on the questions on this on the slide? Um, which situations in in life or in geography or or schedule make a particular replacement water solution more attractive to you? What criteria um, are most important to you in your preferences for replacement water as an impacted resident? And what more information would you need to know to guide your preference? I'll speak from childhood experience, let's see. Is, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. So I spent a lot of time in Northern Wisconsin on my grandparents' farms and their second farm had no running water. So as kids, we spent a lot of time riding bikes or taking tractors or anything we could to go down to the lakefront to get water from the artesian wells for drinking. And it's a lot of, you know, especially older, People, seniors, it's gonna be really tough on them to be able to go out and get water. They're gonna be looking at filling small half gallon jugs. So I think the opportunity for them to be able to get you know, bottled water or water systems delivered to their home, an RO system in their home, that makes it a lot easier at point of use. Um, I would certainly say that you know, being able to communicate with the homeowners in multiple languages, which obviously you guys have looked into that, you know, Spanish is a huge one but we also have quite a bit of a money, um, community here in the area. So making sure that they have ability to access information in their, their native tongue if necessary. And United Way being able to help out. I know you talk about food link, but United Way works well with them as well with the two on one information. So making sure that that information is getting into every home through the mailers, the postings locally at grocery stores where people are most likely to go to be able to access the availability. Thank you, and I, I just wanted to uh, call to your attention uh, that Eric Oriana e echoed what you said about uh, kiosks and water pickup locations as being troublesome for elder community members. Thank you, I appreciate that feedback. That's really useful. Any other feedback, questions? This is really informal. I know, you know, sometimes when we're on our computers, it can feel awkward, but um, we want this to really be a dialogue and a conversation. That, that's really why we've asked you all to join us here tonight. And so we really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your input. Um, it's really important that we are able to have these communications with the community members themselves. We're back now to the how to make your voice heard. So um, I shared this slide earlier, so I'll give Sarah Lee a chance to talk through um, the various forms of communication. Great, so we're so glad that you're here today. Um, 
there are a lot of different communication channels that we've set out to help um, hear from impacted the pandemic and across um, across technology challenges and scheduling challenges. So we've put um, effort into making it possible for people to voice concerns, questions, stories, feedback um, during these public workshops and also offline any time of day. Um, so to make your voice heard or encourage um, other people in the community to make their voices heard, um, we invite you to attend the um, next and final workshop in the January series, which will be focused on private domestic wells and well users. That's Sunday, January 31st from 2 to 4 p.m. And we invite you to stay informed and share your thoughts in either Spanish or English at any time by email, the address is on the screen, by calling the Cuya Water Foundation at the phone number on the screen and leaving a voicemail. Um, when you call, you may, you may reach a live person during work hours. And if not, there's a voicemail line um, so that we can hear comments even that are, are given at midnight or 2 a.m. And those can be anonymous um, or named, whatever people prefer. Um, write a letter to the Cuya Water Foundation at the address on the screen. Um, follow or message the Cuya Water Foundation on social media, on Facebook or Instagram, uh, Cuya Water Foundation. Visit the website, which is cuyawater.org for updates on meetings, um, reports, the surveys. Um, it's our sort of central hub for this kind of information and um, also sign up for email updates on the website. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so Malka, I'll, I'll ask you to go through this slide. Sure, we, could, we couldn't end without a call to action. And, and as, as uh, the Sarahs have been saying, uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, and we'd like uh, to encourage more people to uh, plug into this process as they can. Um, so we're asking uh, you all, if, uh, if you know people who might be interested in this information, uh, please invite them to the uh, remaining workshop in this phase on January 31st. Uh, and uh, if you know people who can't come to the workshop or would rather participate another way, please let people know that there are many ways that they can participate. Invite five people to provide feedback if you can uh, through the survey, um, through, through the email um, or by leaving a voicemail or talking to a, per, a real person at 559-325-4463. Um, uh, uh, the information this meeting is being recorded. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, so if, uh, if those of you who are with organizations, uh, feel free to use the recording and share it uh, with folks in your organization or if there are other ways that you'd like to share the information, please contact us and we can get the information to you however you want it. So I will pause there, ask if there are any uh, more thoughts or questions. Not hearing any, I'll thank you again and um, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we do really appreciate your time this evening. I know it's very valuable to all of us to, to meet in the evening. We did want to have a variety of times that might work better for some schedules. And um, again, looking forward to ongoing uh, conversations and, and working with local impacted users and communities as um, the mission of this foundation gets started in providing both short-term and long-term drinking water solutions. So. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. And we look forward to ongoing conversations and really hopeful that you're able to share um, meeting information and surveys with those who you know that that are interested. So thank you. We all have a good night.